1995, a New Jersey collector bought a batch of 100-year-old wax cylinder recordings. When he played them, he heard more than the tunes he'd bargained for. One recording was of a man admitting to multiple murder. I regret only one murder, murder, and that was of Minnie Williams, because I think I loved her. Loved her. The confessions were made by a doctor, H.H. H. Holmes, days before he was hanged. I was born with the devil in me. The voice was a new clue into one of the most astonishing set of homicides in criminal history. In 1890, Holmes turned his hotel into a production line of murder. Now his words lure the 21st century's top serial killer hunters on a journey to depravity. And two sisters discover their family's terrible secret. And just to picture anybody you know, tied up, burned alive. The story's going to be told. 200 may have died at the hands of America's first serial killer. Oh, my name's Joseph Kozenzak. I was in, uh, involved in law enforcement for over 27 years, and I'm trained uh, with the FBI in criminal and profiling methods, and have dealt with over 60 types of homicide cases and death investigations. I was a chief investigator in one of America's most horrendous serial murder cases. John Wayne Gacy was responsible for strangling 33 young men in the Chicago area over a period of about five years. At that time, which was 1978, I was not familiar with the H.H. H. Holmes case, but I find it very intriguing. Once I received background on this case, I found a lot of parallels. It was during an era when a, a massive exposition was taking place in Chicago. Do, 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 do. Gonna take a Santa man for journey. Do, do, do. Gonna put my heart at ease. The 1890s was America's gilded age. The economy was booming, and America's second biggest city wanted glory. Chicago won the right to hold the country's biggest ever celebration, the Great Columbian Exposition, or World's Fair. In the nearby suburb of Englewood, one man planned to take advantage of the swollen number of visitors. On the corner of Wallace and 63rd Street, H.H. H. Holmes began with a barber shop. He built his own World's Fair hotel and went to work on a money-making scheme. For four years, he murdered his guests, their children, employees and lovers to sell their bodies as dissection specimens. After his arrest in 1894, the killer left a chilling legacy now being studied by one of Britain's leading criminal psychologists. H.H. H. Holmes has left a tremendous resource of confessions, statements to the police, his memoirs. This is a, a fascinating mixture of material that, that tells us, at the very least, how he wants others to see him. The killer's own words allow a psychologist and a detective to travel back a 100 years into the mind of a murderer. <laughs> Herman Webster Mudgett, Herman Webster Mudgett, Herman... America's first serial killer was born Herman Webster Mudgett in Gilmanton, New Hampshire, in 1860. The middle child of a stern postmaster and devoutly religious mother, he grew up a mummy's boy. He took to science and found confidence designing scarecrows and perpetual motion machines. The thing about Mudgett's early years would indicate that if he did become a, a killer by whatever means, for whatever reason, that his style of killing would reflect that fascination with gadgetry and, and planning and getting the whole thing right. The poor boy's smartest plan was to marry the local rich girl and have her pay for his dream ticket from poverty medical school. Gonna play for the sky 
Ain't gonna miss a thing, I'm gonna have my thing, I'm gonna live, live, live until I die. We can find a little bit of a footprint in the historical record of Herman Mudgett. We can trace him through the written record, the record that survived here. And with the first time we come across him is in this ledger volume, and when he enrolls as a medical student, September 21, in 1882. During the first year of Mudgett's medical education, he worked on a cadaver probably every day. Uh, he had three formal lectures a week uh, on various parts of the body. And then he would work on that cadaver on that particular day's lesson. The avalanche of material that you must memorize, and it's a lot like memorizing a phone book. It's a lot of data. Mudgett called all this work ghastly and raged that rich students had it easy. Around that time, tuition was about $100 to $200 a year. So he had to scrape by and get this cash, or he couldn't take the course. <laughs> The school janitor, Doc Nagel, summoned undergraduates to dissection. And this is the bell that he would ring to bring students into classes. This is the actual bell that started Herman Mudgett's medical school career. The cash-hungry student heard what the janitor did between the bells. He was keeper of dissection corpses and frontman for a trade in dead bodies. This is really medical education's dirty little secret. Legally, if they resort to all these the legal traditional means where it's kind of all above board, that they can only meet 20% of their need. There was money changing hands here that's difficult to prove, but Doc Nagel would accept a body and look the other way, even though he knew it may have been obtained in a less than legal manner. Mudgett, you know, had exposure to this and was around when bodies came. Uh, sometimes from questionable sources. Dem bones, dem bones gonna walk around. Dem bones, dem bones gonna walk around. Dem bones, dem bones gonna walk around. Now hear the word of the Lord. A whiff of easy money from the dead would infect Herman Webster Mudgett with an obsession that would last until the day he died. Fantasy to a serial killer is is the whole foundation of why they become a serial killer. The slayings of America's first serial killer sprang from a fantastic plan that a corrupt janitor had inspired in medical student Herman Mudgett. Mudgett was able to see people's bodies as a product as a, that he could make money out of. And I feel that he learned that in medical school. College spawned a criminal fascination with the dead. Mudgett found that by digging up graves and selling bodies, he could pay for his tuition. He shared secrets with another classmate. We found an autograph book that belonged to a classmate that was in the 1884 medical class. And it gets a little you know, eerie when you think of the significance of what he did afterwards, because the inscription reads, I am your true friend, Herman W. Mudgett. And uh, the next page is also a classmate I will also sign it just compliments of R.C. Laycock, Medic, 1884. Not only is it possible that Laycock and Mudgett had a close relationship, it's highly likely. Imagine, if you will, a table just like this, about this wide, and a body in between, who had Laycock on this side and Mudgett on this, working on this body, dissecting it 20 to 40 hours a week for an entire year. Lab partners over their cadaver form a close relationship. After cutting up dissection corpses, Laycock and Mudgett fantasized about a get-rich scam using dead bodies. Their dream was to take out life insurance on a fellow schemer. The plan was this, to produce from a dissecting room three corpses, a man's, a woman's, and a girl's. We were previously to have a man's life insured for $40,000 in favor of his wife and daughter. We were to so arrange things that it would appear that his wife and daughter would apparently be murdered and were to have this simulated tragedy followed quickly by the heartbroken man's own suicide. The borrowed corpses were to take the place of the real parties after we had spirited away the latter. Mudgett would have himself made final beneficiary. He'd collect on the insurance, then secretly split the cash with the family. This dream of family murder might have been forgotten, but for what happened next. Mudgett was not the best student. He finished near the bottom of the class, and actually the faculty 
uh, had to take a second vote whether he should actually be given his medical degree. He just scraped in as a doctor. Now he left the wife who'd paid his way and went chasing another woman in Moore's Fork in upstate New York. But he had to abandon his medical dreams to teach. And when he got engaged, word slipped out he was already married. Mudgett was exposed as a liar and a cheat. On a Sunday morn, saddle made forlorn. On every level, it was a crisis of confidence that must have been just enormously traumatic for him. A triggering factor for serial killers is some type of a personal or psychological stressor. In the fall of 1885, starvation was staring me in the face, and finally I was forced to sell first one and then the last of my two horses. The fact that he was at financial straits at this time would just enhance his, his thought process to create this plan to kill a family off. Mudgett says he wrote to his college conspirator, Robert Laycock, and they began to hunt for corpses. This scheme called for a considerable amount of material, no less than three bodies, in fact. But no doctor could call for three bodies at one time without exciting suspicion. Herman Webster Mudgett. Finding corpses to replace an entire family seemed too risky. So Mudgett decided to pull off the fraud by pretending to kill only himself. Is no more. Throughout 1886, Mudgett worked in a drugstore to pay life insurance premiums. He sent divorce papers to his first wife to lay the groundwork for a disappearance before marrying Myrta Belknap, who was in on the plot. While in Minneapolis, I insured my life for $20,000 in favor of my wife. Herman Mudgett waited for a substitute corpse that would fool the insurance company. But there was a fatal flaw in his plan. I found it more difficult to obtain a body that would prove a substitute for my own. I had a most gloomy wait, lasting about two weeks going to the dead room of the college each morning to inspect the arrivals. Holmes' claim that his staring at bodies day after day over a long period of time turned him into a murderer is very curious. There must be some truth in that, but looking at these bodies, he was able to really push out of his mind that these were human beings and really train himself um, to think about the possibilities of killing. Ironically, Mudgett's failure to switch himself for a dead man drove him into an attempt to kill himself for real. After telling a policeman he was about to commit suicide, he was sent to an insane asylum near Philadelphia in 1888. He left after two months with a new plan. The frightening thing about Holmes is that he was not mad, that he used his intelligence and his ability to plan in order to carry out the killings. They start thinking about strangling, they start thinking about uh, stabbing, and they act out on these, these fantasies. A freshly killed corpse uh, would be much better, and I think that's why he graduated from the anatomy suites of getting bodies that were fixed in formaldehyde to those that were freshly killed, so to speak. It's better material for the purposes he was using them for. So instead of waiting for a corpse, Mudgett lured his best friend to a hotel. After enticing Dr. Robert Leacock to Chicago, I killed him by giving him an overwhelming dose of laudanum. If he's uh, utilized somebody uh, as a victim who has at one point in time been a friend in a possible cohort with him, and he has the ability to kill that person with no qualms. Uh, you can see readily that the formulation of the serial killer patterns have taken place in his mind. And, and his fantasy aspect, which all serial killers have, is probably well developed. Mudgett put his fellow schemer's body on ice in the hotel tub. 
There in the twinkling light of a solitary gas jet lay all that was mortal. The face somewhat resembled the outlines of my own. The graphic detail that Mudgett gives of Laycock's corpse is quite remarkable in terms of the fact that Mudgett is enjoying giving us those details, but also at the same time, he's trying to justify what he's doing by implying that it was for commercial gain. And in doing that, he shows us that he's moved far beyond thinking of the corpse as a person. All he's doing is, is thinking of this as a body that has commercial value to him, and he makes that absolutely clear. I realized that at least $20,000 would come to me after a little further trouble. It's a most unusual day, feel like throwing my worries away. As a doctor called Holmes from Chicago would say, it's a most unusual day. Mudgett dumped the body, dressed in his clothes and identity papers, to be found by the insurance company. And if we want to sing, let the Thus, after a great deal of trouble and thrilling escapes, I added the neat little sum of $20,000 to my bank account. On the surface, it may seem like the money is the primary motivator for him, but in, in essence, this is a person who spends a lot of time fantasizing about death and killing. But overall, there's more and more to this. The, the killing is actually part of the fulfillment of his fantasy process. The money from the Laycock murder bought land on this spot for Mudgett's dream home. He started out with a drugstore and a barber shop while his building rose. He'd call this turreted three-story edifice his castle and fill it with the latest inventions such as gas lighting. The gadgets would be put to work in his new profession. Herman Mudgett was reborn as a homicidal entrepreneur, H. H. Holmes. Holmes got his furniture mover, Wade Warner, to pretend to be the inventor of a new glass bending machine. He had Warner build a glass furnace in the basement to fool investors. Holmes began the next phase of his murder spree, the business murders. The next death was that of Warner. I secured two checks signed by him for a small sum each. To these, I later added the word thousand and the necessary numbers and by passing them through the bank, a very large sum of money was realized. Holmes's business fraud would be exposed if Warner found out about the faked checks. A large kiln was in the castle basement. It was into this kiln that I induced Mr. Warner to go. He had his own personal form of morality. He still knew what he was doing. He knew that it was wrong. And then, I closed the door and turned on the oil to their full extent. In a short time, not even the bones of my victim remained. Holmes now industrialized the hobby he'd learned as a student doctor, raiding graveyards to steal bodies. Even the coffins were recycled and sold at a profit. The castle he built hosted this underground trade in bodies that were taken from graveyards and sold on to medical schools. His traffic in corpses was in full swing when Holmes says he accidentally murdered yet another doctor he was in business with, Dr. Russell. During a controversy concerning the non-payment of rent due me, I struck him to the floor with a heavy chair. I was forced to look about for some safe means of concealing the crime. Why don't you hush, hush, the angel will be knocking at your door. Holmes had a murdered corpse upstairs and a trade in stolen bodies in the basement. It's wonderful in a sense for a killer because it's an avenue for dumping your body by getting him into the medical schools to be used for dissecting purposes it was ideal. My first intention was to dispose of the body to a Chicago medical college. I sold this man's body. Now Holmes had an easy way to get rid of bodies, his business killings became routine. After considerable correspondence, 
I enticed Charles Cole, a southern speculator, into the castle and struck him a most vicious blow upon the head with a piece of gas pipe. But it crushed his skull to such an extent that his body was almost useless to the party who bought it. You don't want evidence of bludgeoning somebody. In his pursuit of the perfect dissection corpse, Holmes installed a vault in his top floor office. Gas could be piped inside. He had found a new way to make businessmen sign over money. I enticed a wealthy banker named Rogers to within the secret room to force him to sign checks and drafts for $70,000. At first, he refused to do so. Finally, by alternately starving him and nauseating him with the gas, he was made to sign the securities. Holmes had moved on by then beyond being just a body snatcher. It's a sadist. They thrive on the fact that they know by applying their various torture techniques that the person is, is suffering great pain. And that, that to them is, is what they need to uh, enhance their fantasies. He was somebody who was totally prepared to abuse and exploit other individuals for Holmes' own commercial ends. Chloroform for Mudgett was the perfect weapon. It's, it's an anesthetic. He didn't want uh, any uh, evidence uh, that these people came to their demise by anything other than a natural way. Holmes got his supply from the clerk at the hotel's drugstore, Mr. Erickson. The need to have that much chloroform is certainly significant. Uh, you, you wouldn't be buying that much chloroform if, if you weren't killing a lot of people and using it to subdue your victims. It's remarkable that we've got the blueprints of the castle that he created. This blueprint gives us an idea of his thought processes, of the, of the factory he was creating for murder. Holmes had separate tradesmen build parts of his design so no one could tell he was shaping the hotel into an abattoir. Holmes is really unique in the history of serial killers because we've seen killers before who will create some sort of cage or cell um, to keep their victims in. But what Holmes has done is to create really a killing machine, a factory for getting these bodies, for harvesting these individuals who innocently have come into contact with him. Holmes leased out five shops on the ground floor and rented out offices and bedrooms upstairs. He had to get corpses unseen from the vault in his office through the rest of the hotel. Holmes could drag a body unseen through his office suite to a private bathroom. This had a trapdoor to drop the body into the bathroom below. A corpse could then be hauled to the dissection lab next door. At the far end of the lab, there was a bottomless closet. A body pushed into this cupboard dropped onto a corpse catchment platform below. To reach the body, Holmes went back to the bathroom, which had a secret stairway leading down to the corpse catchment platform. Holmes then slid the corpse into a chute that fell into the basement. Holmes could get hold of his victims and move them along and down a three-dimensional machine for killing that enabled him to get his innocent people into his, into his web, into his, his mesh in this place that he called his castle. Visitors said the hotel's maze-like layout seemed purpose-built to bring on disorientation. Holmes had converted some rooms into killing chambers. He fitted stopcocks outside so he could make the gas for the gas lights flow into the bedrooms. Holmes could also chloroform guests as they slept, then shift their bodies to the central disposal chute. He could get rid of them and, and get them out without being seen. Hush, hush, the angel will be knocking at the door. Let me... Holmes built a special box lined with tar so as not to leak blood as he took his victims to market and he wouldn't, at that stage, have any compunction at all about how the victim might suffer. 
And to me, that is the best definition of evil. The first corpses rolled off the killing line inside H.H. H. Holmes's Chicago Hotel in 1891. That fits into his overall scheme of being able to line up victims, have the uh, life insurance in place, and then proceeding to kill these people to collect on the insurance. Holmes would produce enough dead policyholders to claim almost a quarter of a million dollars, but he was also killing for easier money, the cash paid by the medical schools for bodies. Chicago's Hahnemann Medical College had trained mechanic Charles Chappell to turn corpses into medical exhibits. Holmes gave him a job in the castle. He first had Chappell saw the arms off a man's body and later showed him a woman's corpse that he had processed for sale. The body looked like that of a jackrabbit, which had been skinned by splitting the skin down the face and rolling it back off the entire body. In some places, considerable amounts of the flesh had been taken off. The process of skinning this person back is essentially an act of dehumanizing the victim. The fact that the flesh has been removed from the body is always an area that the investigators want to look at because there is, there is a chance that this person could be practicing cannibalism. So all of a sudden you have a young man like Mudgett saying, I can get you 30 or 40 or 50 cadavers, whatever you need. No muss, no fuss, I'll get them for you, you pay me the fee. And so it's a dream come true for a medical school professor at uh, you know, the Acme Proprietary Medical School. It's the corruption in the system that's actually help, helping him to do this. Indicates that they paid uh, 20 to 30 dollars at times, and it was usually uh, partly to cover transportation and sometimes fees. To earn more, Holmes installed two vats in the hotel basement. One was filled with carbolic acid, a chemical that dissolves flesh. The other vat contained bleach to whiten the bones. Holmes gave the bones to Charles Chapel to mount into display skeletons. Holmes's profit on a mounted skeleton was $170. It's a brilliant synergistic move. Take the bones and articulate them, and then you can sell something you were going to throw out. So you're doubling your profits in a way, and these were very coveted by medical students, so you could study a skeleton, an articulated skeleton, in the anatomy lab or in the library. We have dozens of them around the medical school to this very day. Throughout 1892, H.H. H. Holmes ran a fully integrated system of murder, corpse preparation, and body sales. Now he began his next phase of killing, the sex murders. Holmes's unfolding narrative starts with him thinking of himself as an insurance fraudster. He moves on to um, dealing with bodies and selling on the bodies and eventually becomes totally um, removed from any feelings about his fellow human beings. He begins to decide that he's going to use the power he knows he can exert over people to exploit them for sexual gratification, and he turns his attention to women. Women were very taken with him. I mean, he was very flirtatious, and they believed what he was telling them. He was apparently very handsome and had a, an incredible personality, and um, women were drawn to him in, in large numbers. Officially, he lived with his wife, Myrta, and their baby, Lucy, at Wilmette, just outside Chicago. Myrta described him as this incredibly loving husband who doted on their child and who always had to have a pet because he loved animals so much. Holmes also loved to staff his business empire with women. He gave out jobs to typists, maids, and shop assistants. He so favored the newfangled idea of a woman's right to work, he set up a ladies' employment agency. What it did is it essentially provided him with a pool of victims 
The victim was a very beautiful young woman in my store. The intended victims were three young women working in Clad my room. only in their night robes. Me trying to chloroform all of them at once. Ran screaming into the street. In the annals of serial killers, it's very unusual for the sexual assaults to come so late in the process. That's usually, for many serial killers, what drives them on to carry out the killing. But it seems that Holmes became aware of his power and that he could get away with murder and late on turned to becoming a sexual predator, um, kidnapping and, and raping and, and abusing women because he knew he would eventually kill them and be able to get away with it. Holmes leased out the castle's jewellery shop to watchmaker Ned Connor, who arrived with his attractive wife Julia and their eight-year-old daughter. Holmes gave the family a room above the store and helped them out again by giving a job to the watchmaker's 17-year-old sister. Now the Connors were in his debt, Holmes began living out his dissection room fantasy of family murder. Within months, the sister was dead. Holmes would confess that when she rejected his sexual advances, he poisoned her. The mysterious death ended the marriage of the watchmaker and his wife. Julia Connors began an affair with Holmes, with no idea he was a killer. Julia became pregnant. On Christmas Eve, 1891, Holmes presented Charles Chapel with a satchel containing the stripped bones of Julia Connor. The severed body of her daughter was buried in the castle's lime pit. When he killed Julia Connor's daughter, he was getting rid of a witness. I mean, this was a child that could incriminate him. If there's a, an eight-year-old child that he thinks is going to get in the way of his activities, he'll kill that child. It won't mean anything to him. Beth and Brenda Peitzel have followed the trail of H.H. Holmes to Philadelphia. The sisters are investigating the murder of their great-grandfather, Ben Peitzel, after finding family papers revealing how his partnership with Holmes ended in a frenzy of child killing and we hadn't been told anything about the story. It was hidden away, but then so after our grandmother died, these newspaper clippings and articles were found at my grandmother's house. And then we really started getting all the, the horrible, horrible details of the whole case. Peitzel was an inventor, and Holmes licensed a coal bin he designed. Holmes even used Peitzel's children to advertise the new gadget. Both Howard, and the little boy that's Swindelli. bending over and getting called, and then the other girl with the shoot there. If you look at those, they really look a lot like There's Alice his, or Nellie. And his own children. So yeah, they kinda... yeah. Holmes sized up the family man for a new job. Holmes was just a small man, five foot seven, about 150 pounds, about my size. Little guy, big mustache. Benjamin being a big guy, over six feet tall, broad, muscular, was really kind of like his uh, henchman, you know, his lackey. Holmes sent his henchmen on the lookout for opportunities. In December 1891, Peitzel told Holmes of a beautiful young typist he'd met, Emmeline Sigrand. Holmes offered her a job in the castle. For the next six months, Holmes wooed the 23-year-old with flowers and trips to the theater. He would lead these women on and act the part of the lover, and then eventually, when he found that either he lost interest in them or they were going to leave him and he f may feel there's some risk involved in that, he'd kill them. In winter 1892, Emmeline Sagrand disappeared. Holmes told other castle tenants Emmeline had left to marry. But Emmeline had no wedding. Holmes gassed her to death because she wouldn't marry him. The killing was escalating and the need to kill was, was building day to day. Initially, he used the vault to uh, secure large sums of money from other victims, but he now has graduated and is using this vault to torture and suffocate a female subject that he was sexually attracted to. The vault would never again be opened until she had ceased to suffer the tortures of a slow and lingering death. Now thousands flocked to Chicago for the World's Fair. Holmes had rooms waiting. But as the fair opened, Holmes thought he'd found an even bigger money earner. 
a Texas heiress answered his ad for a typist. Minnie Williams was a cut above Holmes's usual victims. She was an actress and elocution teacher. She also had something even more attractive to Holmes, $50,000 worth of land in Fort Worth, Texas. But there was a hitch. Minnie Williams had a sister who could claim the family land. Holmes swung another murder plan into action. On the 4th of July holiday in 1893, Holmes picked up Minnie's sister from Englewood Station. I met her at the depot and took her to the castle, telling her Miss Minnie Williams was there. The sister wasn't at her desk. The vault door was open. of Holmes's perversion was burnt inside the vault door. In the process of torturing her, certain chemicals were used on her to, to enhance the torture. The sole of her foot undoubtedly had some type of substance on it so that when her foot was probably pushing on the door from the inside while she was dying, I left the foot imprint on, on the inside of the uh, vault door. Holmes says he now invited Minnie Williams on a train trip. I took Miss Minnie Williams eight miles east of Moments upon a freight line that is little used and ended her life with poison and buried her body. The wax cylinder uh, confession essentially emphasizes the uh, statement about his love that he had for, for his victim. I regret only one murder, and that was of Minnie Williams, because I think I loved her, I loved her, I loved her. The recording hints at Holmes's driving force. It's hard to, to call it love, but I think it's, it's some format of uh, an obsession. Holmes was a compulsive stalker. One murder, one murder. Holmes was stalking and obsessed with particular women. He was no longer an individual who had any real human feelings. will be happy, In 1892, Chicago police set up a missing persons bureau to trace hundreds who had disappeared in the lead up to the World's Fair. Over the previous three years, H.H. H. Holmes had murdered so many visitors to his World's Fair hotel, he had a backlog of bodies. Sometimes a killer will want to keep the body around for his own fantasy needs. Yes, Police went to see Holmes in November 1893 about money frauds he'd been pulling off and saw packages of human body parts waiting for shipment. They asked me the contents of two small barrels. I gave them some misleading answers. As soon as possible after this, I commenced its destruction by burning. With police closing in on his corpse factory, Holmes set fire to the castle's top floor. And on New Year's Day, he fled Chicago with his Coleman, Ben Peitzel, to cash in on the property of the murder victims. Holmes insured Peitzel's life for $10,000 at the start of their cross-country tour. Benjamin Peitzel's great-granddaughters picked up their trail from clues hidden in family papers. The plan was for Benjamin to move to Philadelphia, open the patent office, and him be in operations for a little while before they had any quote-unquote accidents or before there was any kind of a quote-unquote death as part of the insurance scams. Benjamin and his family was told that a body would be substituted for Benjamin's body and it would look like Benjamin died. Holmes arranged to meet Peitzel in the Philadelphia Patent Office on September the 2nd, 1894. What ended up happening is Holmes actually murdered Benjamin Peitzel. He did not substitute a body. This is Holmes' confession. Only one difficulty presented itself. It was necessary for me to kill him, speaking of Benjamin Peitzel. 
in such a manner that no struggle or movement of his body should occur. I overcame this difficulty by first binding him hand and foot and proceeded to burn him alive by saturating his clothing and his face with benzene and igniting it with a match. So, so horrible, horrible was, was this, this torture, torture that in writing of it, I have been tempted to attribute his death to some other humane means, not with a wish to spare myself, but because I fear that it will not be believed that one could be so heartless and depraved. The least I can do is spare my reader a recital of the victim's cries for mercy, his prayers, and finally his plea for a more speedy termination of his sufferings, all of which upon me had no effect. Wow. Um, it's 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 very upsetting to me. Um, I've never read this before. This yeah. is new information, and um, this, yeah. it's very difficult, as you can tell, for me you to read this because picture this going on, and, and this is somebody that was my great grandfather. I might not have known him, but his blood runs in my veins. I mean, you know, just to picture anybody, you know, tied up, burned alive, and it with, just you know chemicals like that, and be. Screaming, reinforces pleading. basically my hatred for the man. And, but to hear the details, uh, yeah, that's, of, um, uh, Holmes recounting it. That's a lot yeah. more upsetting, actually. I've never heard it in that detail, so. Once you're on the roller coaster of killing people, kidnapping them, poisoning them with gases, using acid, um, you're bringing into your web uh, women uh, to exploit and abuse and then to kill. I mean, then anything's possible, and uh, an individual who is doing all that will be exploring further and further what types of gratification he can get out of the victims he has available to him. When the insurance was paid out, serial killer H.H. H. Holmes realized his victim's wife and children could also claim the money. Holmes told Carrie Peitzel her murdered husband was actually in hiding and volunteered to take her children to him. It was also upon the 8th, early in the forenoon, that I went to the repair shop for the long knives I had previously left there to be sharpened. Eight-year-old Howard was killed first. His body was cut up, burned, and stuffed up the chimney of a house in Indiana. Holmes took the girls, Alice and Nellie, north to Canada. They were writing letters that they Telling would about what they did, where they were, where they were, dated, and yet Holmes never doing. mailed them. Dear Grandma and Grandpa, hope you are all well. We have not had any nice weather at all. Nell and I have both got colds. Tell Mama Howard is not with us now. Holmes now adapted his luggage trunk into a portable gas chamber. On October the 25th, 1894, he put the two girls inside. The evidence would indicate that there was some type of sexual activity with both of these victims. He may have raped, possibly even molested the children. When, they're, when they were put in the trunk, they were naked. Holmes rented this house in Burlington, Vermont, for his final fantasy of family murder. Everybody, the entire family. He, he plotted to kill Carrie Peitzel, Desi, the oldest daughter, and our grandfather, the baby warden. So we wouldn't baby. even be here. But the insurance company became suspicious Peitzel's death was no accident. They hired Detective Frank Geyer to track down who had taken out the policy. Police arrested Holmes in Boston, but had no idea he was a murderer. They didn't have enough information about his other crimes to convict him of anything other than the insurance fraud scam. And because Ben Peitzel was burnt beyond recognition, Holmes claimed his was a corpse snatched from the morgue and that Peitzel was living the high life on the run. Now Holmes became a celebrity for pulling off graveyard insurance scams. He decided to write a book about himself while he was in prison. The memoir, like most memoirs from serial killers, is a justification. It's an attempt 
to present the view of himself that he wants others to see. Um, but it does indicate that he was um, a very intelligent man, a very verbal, verbally capable individual. And you can see how he could talk and charm others into believing in his plausibility. He was the perfect villain, but he was also sort of this mysterious and handsome villain and well-spoken, and he just continued to be compelling throughout. Holmes had got away with it. He was a top-selling author whose book of lies hoodwinked the world on how he'd used murders to fool insurance men. But the insurance detective had cottoned on to Holmes's mistake, keeping the murdered girl's letters. Frank Geyer would have never been able to backtrack and figure all this out, where these kids were and where he was at these different cities and all, right. without those letters. Holmes had those in his possession. He had never mailed them. The letters to, to the, the kids. The children to their had mailed to their mom. Yeah, never mailed the them letter. and had them in his possession. And that was, you know, that was basically putting the rope around his neck himself. Right. Tell my mom. Alice's letters led Geyer to the house in Toronto. Headlines recast Mudgett from a swindler into a sex criminal. And then, as a new phenomenon, the multi-murderer. Howard is not the best in my house. The day after Alice and Nellie were found, detectives broke into the Chicago hotel. They found the killing vault, blooded women's clothing, and rotted human remains. When police found a length of rope, they realized Holmes had designed the house itself to do the killings. He shaped an instrument for murder that was the building. After they'd been chloroformed, hanging them, using the building, very carefully constructed so that the hanging body would be then easily accessible. Charles Chapel handed police the last bag of bones delivered by Holmes. One victim, thought to be the watchmaker's wife, Julia Connor, was recovered as a mounted skeleton from Harneman Medical School. Frank Geyer was still searching for young Howard Peitzel. A month after he found the girls, Geyer found the boy's burnt remains in the Indiana house. No longer fooled by Holmes's stories of swapping corpses, Philadelphia put him on trial for the Ben Peitzel murder. In Philadelphia, the trial of H.H. H. Holmes was basically the biggest thing that had ever happened to the city. Holmes was declared guilty and uh, sentenced to death, and that was also another opportunity for the press to really get involved in the case. He made his last killing when newsmen paid for his confession to 27 murders. But clues in Chicago suggested as many as 200 had died. There were many, many more victims than, than he's ever uh, admitted to killing. Dozens of people beyond the 27 because of a lot of the police reports that were filed and were attributed to being people that had been associated with the castle. Finally, the wax cylinder company rushed out Holmes's own ideas on why he'd been born to kill. I cannot help the fact that I was a murderer. No more than a poet can help the inspiration to a song, to a song, Herman to a song, Webster to a song. Mudget. Well, I think he's certainly Webster America's Mudget. most uh, gruesome serial Herman killer. He was a cunning, planning killer. Holmes was the first person in, in modern times who was able to take advantage of the complexities and anonymity of modern society in order to kill and kill again um, without being detected. And in doing that, he led the way for serial killers who came after him and began to increase in numbers um, 50, 60 years later. This is actually the place where Holmes murdered our great-grandfather, Benjamin Peitzel. We wanted to come and see where the site actually happened so that we could bring some sort of closure, some sort of farewell or goodbye. This is where you could grieve. This is where you could say hey, your goodbye. we haven't forgot you, Ben. Benjamin and Kerry, together to the end. Holmes walked to the scaffold on the 7th of May, 1896, still in the grip of his dissection room fantasy. His last request was to be buried under concrete. 
so his body would never be dissected. Dry bone, 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 dry bone